And here we go. Welcome to the September 18th City Council meeting. We have some really special guests tonight, a whole bunch of them. Let's all clap. Yeah. We have Cub Scout Den 9, and they are here to help us lead the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Cub Scouts, would you please stand up? And audience, would you please join us? May everybody face this way. All right, you ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. So we have a representative. His name is Ryan. Right, Ryan? And you're going to come up to the microphone and stand to the side so we can see you. There you go. Very good. And you're speaking on behalf of all of the Cub Scouts tonight. Tell us where everybody's from. Which school? Well, most of the kids go to Westwood, but I homeschool and some of them go to Sanger. So we have Homeschool, Sanger, and Westwood, and yes. they're a really good bunch. And you have more energy <laughs> than any of us <laughs> up here, and we like it, and we'd like to just bottle a little bit of it. <laughs> sure. And why were you here tonight? You, you came here for one reason. To help with the, with the flag ceremony. And you did a great job, a very nice job. So I'm going to come down there. Let's get a picture. And you'll get a little special treat. And then the beauty of this is that you don't have to sit here for the whole meeting. You get to Yay! go. Yay! Thank you. I do not want to sit here for the entire meeting watching nonstop talking. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. If I wear one of those shirts, do I get to leave me? <laughs> I assume that's your kid. Hey, guys. Like herding cats. <laughs> Seriously, wouldn't we like that energy? Okay, we, then our next item is uh, a proclamation, and Shirley Weeks. There she is. Whereas, Stillwater has a long history of community arts programs that have enhanced the quality of life of its citizens. And whereas, in 1971, a group of people, including art students, set up a studio for ceramic and other media in an old barn in Couch Park. The Pottery Project in Old Cold Barn was a fun, heartwarming experience for children. And whereas, in the 1980s, art programming shared the Senior Citizen Center building in Couch Park and was named Multigraphics. It was a small, very friendly area 
and art projects were sometimes defined by the space available. And whereas in 2002, the city celebrated the opening of the Multi Art Center, a new beautiful building designed to serve the needs of a progressive art community, including an art gift gallery. And whereas in 2012, the city contracted with the Friends of the Multi Arts to operate the Multi Arts Center. And whereas the mission of community art programming has always been to promote art, provide art education and experiences for the citizens of Stillwater, and whereas multi-arts has provided art instruction for generations of community members and hundreds of citizens, young and old, have participated in these life-enhancing programs of arts, crafts, and fellowship. Now, therefore, I, Gina J. Noble, Mayor of the City of Stillwater, and my fellow city councilors do hereby recognize and honor the history of the Community Arts Program in Stillwater. Would you like to say something? Okay. Uh, this special event. Here, come right up here. Uh, this special event is to recognize the dedication, perseverance, and hard work of many art pioneers who shared the common goal of providing art for our community. We are happy to accept this proclamation for the Stillwater Park and Recreation Department, Multigraphus, MultiArt, and the staff and artists, teachers, students, volunteers, and the people of Stillwater. Are there anybody here tonight that was involved in 1971? I'm sorry they're not here. I talked to several people, and you'd be surprised at how young they still are. Uh, <coughs> we celebrate art. We celebrate our glorious art history. We celebrate our glorious art future as art with gladness and exuberance. We thank you for uh, this proclamation. Thank you, Shirley. And that brings us to the consent docket. Counselors, does anyone wish to remove an item or clarify anything, or is there a motion to approve the consent docket? Motion to approve the consent docket. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. Please vote. And with a vote of five to zero, the consent docket is approved. And that takes us to public hearings. Item A has been postponed to October 16th. Uh, Mr. Dorman, we need to, a motion and a second and a vote, yeah. correct? Okay, did I miss something? I, no, this is for seven C. Sorry. Motion no. to postpone item A to October 16. Second. We have a motion and a second to postpone item A. Please vote. And with a vote of five to zero, item A is postponed until October 16th. That brings us to item B. Received public comment regarding a request for a map amendment to rezone 316 South Stallard from P public to office, public to O office, CC-17-135. Mr. Dorman, did we have good notice on this? Yes, ma'am. Mr. McNichol. Paula Dennison, Development Services Director, will provide the report. Good evening. We have a request for a rezoning of property that is going to be very familiar to uh, most everybody looking at this. This is the former Highland Park Elementary School at Stollard and 3rd Avenue. Um, currently the property is zoned public and the new owners are asking that it be rezoned to office um, you can see the surrounding uses is residential, single family, small lot, the zoning. There are single family residential uses around the property, except immediately here to the south is a church. This is a view of the property. There are some um, planned uses for um, 
for the property. One of the, the unique things about this property is it is such a large piece of property with a large building set up in the <coughs> configuration of an elementary school. So the um, new owners are proposing some adult day services, some vocational services for the disabled, a church, a church is currently using a portion of the property, and maybe even some other nonprofit organizations to more fully utilize the existing building and uh, um, keep it in, in a good condition. The findings that were made by the Planning Commission, this, as everyone knows, historically a neighborhood elementary school since the Highland Park Elementary School's relocation, this property has been underutilized. The request, however, is not compatible with the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan does identify this large piece of property as public, because that's how it had been used. Office district typically provides a transition between residential and the higher intensive commercial, but as you saw on the map, this one piece of property is completely surrounded by residential zoning, and then there's the church use that is, is um, also in the residential zoning. The proposed uses that were outlined, they are allowed in the office zoning district. They would not be allowed in the public zoning district, but the <coughs> public is for lands that are owned by a public governmental type entity such as the school district, the city, the county, the state, or federal, or um, Oklahoma State. And as I mentioned, there are single family residential uses and a church surrounding the property. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have on this request. Councilors? In the, uh, Paula, in the planning yes, commission notes, there was uh, a question about drainage. Yes. Uh, one of the adjacent property owners um, voiced a concern because of drainage on the, let me get the map back up here, on this part of the lot, uh, which is, you can barely see my mouse, uh, the southwest corner of the, the existing property. And um, Mr. Carnes with Transportation and Stormwater Services, he and I went out there and walked the property one day. And um, unfortunately, it is a private matter between the two property owners. There is a flume, you can see the concrete underneath this barely, that um, when the school was there, they installed the flume to help divert some of the runoff from the ground to Third Avenue. So that flume is performing its function. I have since spoken with the adjacent property owner that was concerned, let her know that Mr. Carnes and I went out there. She appreciated the city touching base and taking a look at it and just letting her know that we have advised um, the engineer for uh, the school district who designed the flume and we're also gonna let the new owners know that they need to take a look at that corner back there. Thank you. Yes. Other questions? Okay, we don't have anyone. I'm going to open the public meeting, but we don't have any speakers, so I will close the public hearing, and I will come back to Paula. The Planning Commission is sending a recommendation of approval from the RSS to the Office Zoning District. Okay, counselors, more questions? No. All right, is there a motion on the recommendation? Motion to accept the recommendation of the Planning Commission. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept the recommendation on CC-17-135. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero, CC-17-135 is approved. That moves us to item C, receive public comment regarding a request for a map amendment to rezone 1005 South Duncan Street from RT Residential Two Family to RTM Residential Two Family and Multifamily, CC-17-134. Mr. Dorman, did we have good notice on this? Yes, ma'am. Mr. McNichol. And Ms. Dennison will continue her uh, report on this item as well. Thank you. This is another map amendment that is being presented before you this evening. The property is um, located on the east side of Duncan, south of 10th Avenue. 
It is in uh, an area that the entirety is zoned um, RT, which is our two-family residential district. On the north side of 10th is the commercial business or the downtown business zoning district that we have. Um, across Duncan is zoned public because this is where the Stillwater Public Library is located in those properties. Surrounding uses, you can see the zonings, the surrounding uses in this um, block in particular are single family residential. Um, and of course we do have the library, the multi-arts, and then um, even some residential uses in the business district. Um, and then you get back to the east and there's more business uses and activity. This is a picture of the property. It is in um, a bit of disrepair. One of the unique things about this area of Stillwater is that uh, many years ago when the houses were developed, the single family houses were developed, if you can see in the very back, it's a garage, but it also has an apartment on the second story of the garage. So many of the houses um, in old town or original town of Stillwater, um, we have found that usually the garages have been just converted to garages, but used to hold a lot of second story apartments in them. That is the case on this piece of property. So there are two detached structures currently on the property, the single family residence and then the garage with the apartment above it. Uh, these have not been used as residential for some time. The RT zoning, as it is currently zoned, allows for attached uh, structures <coughs> on the property, so a duplex as long as it is attached. The reason for the request to zone from RT to RTM, which is two-family and the less dense multifamily residential district. The reason for the request is the applicant would like to go back in the fashion that the property is developed now with a single-family residence and a separate detached second residence over a garage on the property. Uh, if the rezoning goes through from RT to RTM, the, um, the applicant will need to get a specific use permit to establish the single family use on the property because the nonconformity, that grace period you have when you stop using a piece of property in the form you have used it, that nonconformity has expired. <coughs> Uh, the comprehensive plan does identify this as, make sure I get my notes right, as commercial, actually. Um, the RT zoning, as I said, allows two attached dwelling units. The request is for RTM so that they can do a detached single family that will require the SUP as well as the apartment over the garage. The rezoning is considered spot zoning and I'll show you right quickly. It is taking a small lot out of surrounding where there is no other uh, zoning that uh, is compatible with the request that they're asking. The applicant does want to improve the property. Um, we did discuss an option of just remodeling the existing structures, not tearing them down, but remodeling them. And that way they would not have to have come through any of this process at all. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Counselors. So um, <clears throat> kind of familiar with the area and all of the areas around there are, have a zoning designation of RT, but there's not any duplexes anywhere around there, correct? They're all single family homes. Yes. Right, so what? Single family plus. Single family <laughs> plus. So what, I mean, just out of curiosity, why is that if this is the kind of our our duplex zoning, why was that zoning district chosen for those properties as opposed to something else? You know, zoning districts have changed over the years, and anytime there is a, a major undertaking of zoning district change, like an update of our land development code in 2008 when it was completely redone, um, staff and um, the process tries to determine the <coughs> proper zoning at the time. 
it didn't fit in a single family because there were more than one residential use on the property. Mm -hmm. So the closest district we had at the time under the land development code was the RT or the duplex zoning. Okay. So did you say this was in the C3 plan? Supposed to be commercial? Commercial, yes. So we have RT, which it is. Yes. Commercial, which it's predicted. Yes. And this request, which is RTM. Yes. For and, one. You, and uses that are existing that really don't fit into any one of those designations. No. <laughs> is, it, is it possible to do what the applicant wants to do just with a special use permit under existing zoning? Under the RT, I mean, um, let me get my, conventional single family is allowed. Um, by right, a duplex, which again is the attached to structures is allowed There is not a separate SUP for detached to family. Okay, under the so no, sir. RT zoning. Under the RT zoning. Which has to be attached or one. Okay. <laughs> it's odd to me because we evidently, we made this two residential, two family zoning because these lots have existing resi you know, separate residential structures, but that zoning that we made it doesn't actually cover what what was already there mm -hmm. and so uh I, I mean is there another mechanism to revive the <clears throat> the prior use exception uh i mean it just seems odd to have to rezone the, the this this one little lot when <coughs> the zoning that's there was evidently put in place to allow what's already there uh, i mean that it, it seems like the wrong mechanism there therefore our um our conversation with the applicant of simply remodeling the structures and not taking them down. Okay. That was, that was the only available option without coming through any approval process that we were able to determine. But there's no other option for us other than rezoning Rezone. the lot. We can't just do a, okay. Well, and I mean, to kind of address the issue of spot zoning, yes, this is spot zoning in the strictest definition but it seems like all of the properties there were zoned incorrectly in the first place right so i mean just to address the spot zoning issue and sorry no go ahead it, i mean is there a zoning classification that allows for detached two <coughs> two individual residential detached units on a lot rtm it's, uh, it's the least the dense one. that's okay. the least dense <laughs> but that you said that requires a special use permit anyway to establish single family separate yes so there's no separate. by right there's detached more than one detached single family zoning classification and well another no another um, concern is in our RT zoning district it also specifically says that um, each individual unit dwelling unit must be on a separate lot so there's also the division of land that would be required for this, creating nonconformities because this lot is barely over 6,000 square feet. So it's a very small lot also. So there are multiple things going on here That's, that we do not have a single answer for. Yeah, that was another question I had because the minimum requirement for an RTM zoning, at least from what I've read, is 20,000 square feet. Is that correct? Um, RTM is, yes, 20,000 square feet. So this currently is a legally non-conforming lot anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, alleviating some of the non-conformities that you have on this property. Use, that can be alleviated. Okay. Lot size, that cannot be alleviated through any zoning action. Okay. That would be the acquisition of additional properties. Mm -hmm it would carry that legally non-conforming lot size no matter what happened to the zoning. Okay. So we finally have a zoning issue in which 
someone actually wants to utilize the property for what it was and, and we're not changing it to I mean it's it truly is taking the existing structure and that has not been lived in that has not been used and having it be a livable area mm -hmm. that's not a duplex it's not a 10-story apartment building I mean it really is what it was intended to be so it could, I thought it was going to be a duplex. No. 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 They're, they're no. going to put it back with yeah. the single family single structure family, and then a garage and then with an a apartment garage. over it. It fulfills mm -hmm. what that area, that neighborhood looks like, what it feels like, what it's kind of being revived to be. But it's not We're, the existing structure. We're tearing the We're existing structure down and down rebuilding it. Zoning, correct. And that's correct. And the parking, would it, is there anything about parking that would be different between RTM and RT? And No, ma'am. It's based on the use of the property and how many units you have. So it would remain whatever, whatever the code compliant is. Are there any other properties in this area that this will happen to? I mean, this is, or is this just an anomaly? Uh, this is not an anomaly. Okay. So we could see this again if someone wanted to take... There, there's great opportunity for reinvestment and revitalization in this area. And there have been there have been no um, oh, what's the term? <clears throat> there's been nobody that wants to redevelop any of this land for commercial at this point. Is that no, correct? there has not. Just making sure. Is there anything else on, that can be on RTM besides a residential multi? Yes, um, to name a few, churches, multifamily with a gross density of 20 units per acre. Of course, with the size of this property, you're not going to see an apartment complex going in on 6,000 square feet. A townhome with a specific use permit, schools, health care and social assistance, or child and adult care services, as well as the conventional single family. The lot size is going to limit what goes in on this property. At 20 so units per acre, what does 6,000 feet get you? That's math that I can't do, I'm sure you know. <laughs> you know, I'm not an engineer. They're much better at math than I. It seems like less than one. Well, <laughs> Yeah, they're, maybe 30, maybe they're, they're allowed to have, they're allowed to have two in the configuration okay. it is. Does that help? <laughs> well, I just, I mean, the concern would be, honestly, would be if we, if we do make it RTM and then at some point <clears throat> the current owner or, or future owner decided to tear down the house and build some kind of apartment structure that didn't fit the neighborhood, that wasn't, you know, the, the same as what used to be there, would we have a problem where somebody could come in and put, you know, four units on top of each other in that <coughs> buy up adjacent parcels and demo those houses and that, combine right, them but, to do but it but given the lot size we don't really have a concern <coughs> yeah, yeah. with somebody building a multi-family multi-unit apartment building on this lot i'm not concerned with anybody building an apartment complex on this 6,000 square foot property <laughs> thank you <laughs> you're welcome they would have to have 20,000, and so they'd have to buy up a lot of the <laughs> land around there right <laughs> they would have to buy a lot of land around there yes I will let you know one other one other um, piece of information has nothing uh, no bearing on your action here tonight. But the applicant has also filed for a variance before the Stillwater Board of Adjustment because the structures are located they're encroaching into the setbacks that any zoning district nowadays would have because of the age of these structures. So um, they are hoping to be able to proceed with a positive from the city council and they'll go to the board of adjustment and get some variances so they can go back in just about the same footprint that they have existing on the property. <clears throat> Any other questions? This was a great one. We need to use Zoning 101 <laughs> on a situation like this. Okay. So if there are no questions, we do have two speakers for the public hearing. So at this time, I will open the public hearing. The first speaker is Kelly Harris. Good evening, Kelly Harris with Keystone Engineering, located at 923 South Lowry, Lowry representing the owner tonight. Um, well, you all have already hit on all the major points that I was going to point out. <laughs> um, and so I just, I'll just kind of reiterate, um, we are requesting the RTM zone. Um, 
because that's obviously the only zoning classification that we can find that fits to utilize the same use that it has been being used in. Um, they do, the owner does want to reconstruct the existing two structures on the same foundation. So that he would like to utilize the same service connections that are already there um, just to, to use some of, some of what's there and not have to reconstruct the whole thing. Um, Kelly, can I ask you something? Yes, definitely. Can he go higher, oh, you said he, so. Can the owner go higher up in an RTM? Can you build a bigger structure than you can in an RT? Um, I believe the roof height is still at 35 feet. Um, mm -hmm. But again, back to the lot size, we are limited to two units. Then that's the, um, the density um, math that you guys were looking for earlier. <laughs> that, okay, yeah, clarification, 35 feet is the, the highest. Um, there are other multiple properties within this block that are already doing the same thing. Um, so you could see this potentially uh, in the future um, if they want to get into the spec and uh, do things correctly. Um, they do have the apartments over the garages. Um, even though they're not zoned that way, uh, the zoning classification would allow us to um, do what we would like to do. Um, as you mentioned before, on a map, this would look like spot zoning. However, it, it doesn't really fit into um, the uses that are being used out there. Um, and Corey will probably touch on this a little bit later also. At the planning commissioning mission meeting, there was a neighbor to the south there that um, does not want duplexes built. Uh, there's no other duplexes in this area, so keeping this as a single family style um, tract of land was preferable to him. That was all I had. Any, Any questions? questions? Kelly, could you repeat again? Uh, the owner's going to um, use the same foundations? Correct. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. Once he gets in there, I mean that. It's so interesting <laughs> that you could remodel what's there, which is not in great shape, or take it down to the foundation and go through all this rigmarole. Yeah. It's interesting. And he may touch on uh, how the condition of those existing structures are present. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Corey Williams. Mm -hmm. Corey Williams, 621 South Husband, uh, Stillwater, and uh, Principal Manager for Outer Banks LLC, the applicant. <clears throat> I love to be a challenge, so here we are. Um, to the remodeling uh, request, actually in the city of Stillwater, if you are going to be remodeling more than 50%, it's considered new construction. Um, by the interpretation of the code. So I can't remodel the structure. We purchased it at sheriff sale for 30,000, had been abandoned. Um, we'll have a solid 175,000 in the remodel. I know that because we just recently remodeled uh, 1101 South Duncan and the mother-in-law suite above that uh, detached two car garage um, at 213 uh, West 11th and we had 174,000 on top of the purchase price in doing that, and we used the existing foundation, and actually used all the existing framing. Uh, it was just new electric, plumbing, HVAC, uh, significant um, foundation repairs, and, and things like that. Um, this is an effort really to preserve the integrity uh, of the neighborhood, and to Councilors Wedlake and Joyce's point, um, I was a little bit shocked too, whenever we bought it, and I had to rezone, get a variance, get a special use permit to knock down and reconstruct exactly what exists on the lot right now. And I say exactly because it is going to be a three bedroom as it is currently, but because of today's market, we'll probably add at least two bathrooms to that. So it'll probably be a three bedroom, three bathroom by the time we get done. Two car detached garage with a mother-in-law suite above it. Um, and as Kelly said, the neighbor was present at the last meeting we can go in and, and knock everything down right now and build a very generic duplex, but I don't think that fits the neighborhood. And on my heart, I'm a preservationist. In 15 years of doing this, it's the first time I've ever had to knock something down. If any of you walked through it with me, you would understand why we're knocking it down. It's, uh, it's rough. And so um, we have six different properties in about a block radius of there that we're trying to uh, renovate, preserve, and reinvigorate that entire neighborhood. Um, 
so we don't plan on putting any apartments up. I would love to be able to remodel. We've done that several times. I just can't do it in this particular instance and comply with city zoning. Um, about the only other option would be to construct both structures, put a walkway between them, and attach a covered uh, walkway over that. Um, I'm going to have about $2,700 in this rezone uh, application process. I'd have about $6,000 in constructing the connected structures. And honestly, it feels like I'm trying to circumvent the code, which really in my heart, we're not trying to do. There is a two-story structure that is original next door to us on the north, and it's an investment property that we do not own. There is an owner occupied next door, um, and he was at the Planning Commission and very much would rather this stay a single family residence with a mother-in-law suite. Be glad to take any questions. Councilor? So, Corey, just of the six properties that you own around that area, how many of those are duplexes? There's actually, um, and this was mentioned at, at planning, I think by city staff, there's not a single duplex uh, on that block from 10th to 11th, Duncan to husband uh, at all. Those are all single family structures. Some of them do have the mother-in-law suite, some of them do not. Um, we own four on the 11th Street side, one of which has the mother-in-law suite, none of, well, that's not true. Um, I did acquire a duplex at the corner of husband and um, 11th and it's currently vacant and will probably be before this body uh, in some other form or fashion because it is structurally not so great either any more questions and I can tell you that it was butchered into being a duplex it was not originally constructed as a duplex <laughs> it's funny yeah. there's no duplexes in the duplex zoning in that area so. none at all and, and and we were a little bit shocked about it as well thank you so much right. I appreciate thank the opportunity you. okay at this time I will close the public hearing Ms. Tennyson the Planning Commission does send a recommendation of approval to rezone from RT to RTM Councilors, any more discussion? If not, is there a motion? Motion to accept the Planning Commission's recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero, that is approved. CC to, oh, sorry. That would be CC-17-134 is approved. It brings us to general orders. Mr. McNair. We have a presentation by Dan Batchelor, Center for <laughs> Economic Development Law on a proposed project plan and creation of tax increment district under the Local Development Act. He will explain all that to you. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, distinguished members uh, of the council. I'm Dan Batchelor, uh, appearing here with my colleague, Lisa Harden. Uh, we are members of the Center for Economic Development Law, uh, which you have engaged to perform an assessment and develop recommendations regarding uh, possible strategies for the uh, revitalization of the core of the city of Stillwater. The only question uh, before the council this evening is whether you should consider the possibility of convening a review committee to make recommendations to you regarding uh, uh, the future of the core of your community. There is no specific project plan before the City Council or specific approval action on a plan uh, proposed or requested at this point in time. So the only action that could be authorized this evening based on the agenda uh, for this evening's meeting is to consider authorization of the formation of a review committee to consider the possibility and the desirability and the potential impacts uh, of a strategy to encourage reinvestment and to bring new life to the core of the community. Our firm, the Center for Economic Development Law, was requested to assess the current conditions in the heart of the community and to provide recommendations to you on the question of whether the city should consider the possibility of adopting a strategy for bringing new life, new vitality, to the center of Stillwater. These are our conclusions and recommendations. First, there is a need to consider a strategy to revitalize and bring fresh life to the core of the community. 
One of the ways we see this very powerfully demonstrated is the fact that the investment and growth in the suburban areas and in, and in the county over the last decade is vastly outpacing the reinvestment and new investment in the core of the city. To demonstrate that point, the county growth over the last decade has had a rate of growth that is more than two and a half times the rate of value growth either in the city, the municipality, or in the Stillwater Public School District. So there's a vast disparity in the new investment, the reinvestment, and the invigoration, the economic life. So does that create a need? In our view, it does. The uh, Oklahoma Local Development Act, uh, which is one of the most useful tools, we statutory tools we have in the state of Oklahoma, is constitutionally authorized, but it authorizes a city, town, or county to adopt a project plan to consider a strategy to reverse the circumstances and conditions in blighted areas, but it's not limited to blighted areas. It also includes areas that are undeveloped or undeveloped, areas that are suffering various degrees of stagnation and decline. The Local Development Act does not require that the heart of the patient stop beating before a community takes action to breathe new life into that core. Uh, the core of the city, including its downtown and the area connecting it to the university, do have significant assets which, if nourished by reinvestments and by new activities, could generate new vibrancy and new life in the community of Stillwater. But in order to do this, it's our opinion and our recommendation that you should consider the adoption of a strategic plan. We recommend that because there are natural impediments to reinvestments in the core of a community. It's aged, its infrastructure is older, in need of repair, replacement, uh, and the need for public infrastructure coupled with the, nat the natural difficulties of redeveloping and reinvesting in older areas tends to discourage most, but obviously not all, uh, uh, potential in investors in the core of the community. And we believe that a strategy should be adopted to reverse that condition and enhance and attract new investment and bring new life to the heart of the com community. That means, in our opinion, that you must bring multiple resources to bear on this effort. It is not like letting a single construction contract for a public improvement or a street. You let the contract, the contractor takes care of the responsibility, pay the bill, and it's done. Community revitalization requires a community effort. That means commitment, public and private. It means interest across the board. It means support and buy-in from the taxing jurisdictions in your area. So multiple supports and multiple strategies are necessary. Obviously, it does include the need for financing tools, and the use of tax increment financing is one of those tools. In many respects, it's unique because there's none quite like it. Uh, but an effective strategy should not be limited to the use of a single tool. Uh, it is important that a community bring to bear on that reinvestment strategy other tools, such as uh, the creation of business improvement districts. I know that you had one recently expire in the heart of the community. Uh, we think consideration should be given to creating a new business uh, improvement district, perhaps one in the downtown area and one in the area uh, connecting uh, uh, properties that are adjacent to the university where you already have significant other commercial activity, but maybe a different clientele and a different range of interest. It is also our opinion that the use of the business improvement districts should be, should heavily emphasize the generation, the planning, the support, the organization, the community participation in events and activities that bring life. Just passive investments and physical improvements alone will not create the level of reinvestment and attraction that is possible, we believe, in the core of this wonderful community. Uh, we also believe and will recommend that any strategy include a long-term financial partnership 
with the Stillwater public school system. It is our opinion, based on observation uh, <coughs> in many communities around the state, that the quality of life in our communities is heavily dependent upon economic health and educational health. Those two endeavors are, are linked together. And if we do not recognize the linkage, we will miss our opportunities for the future. So it will be our recommendation that the beginning of a financial partnership uh, be considered uh, in connection with uh, uh, any proposed project plan. So to summarize uh, our view, uh, it's our opinion that the Stillwater community is positioned to take advantage of many new opportunities. You have assets uh, that are immensely valuable and that could not be duplicated if fully lost. But if not nourished, the opportunities may pass. You have an array of assets ranging from education to commercial, from research to the arts, from private enterprise to public service. So the timing is, we believe, appropriate to broaden and intensify the community efforts to enhance the quality of life and to multiply future investment and development and that this can be achieved by adopting and implementing an appropriate strategic project plan. Therefore, we recommend that you do authorize consideration of a project plan by convening a review committee and to focus on a plan uh, that builds on existing assets, whether they be physical, commercial, institutional, by also intensifying strategies for activities and events, for education and skill training, for job creation, and concentration of, of reinvestment in the core of the community. If those steps are taken, it is our opinion that the community of Stillwater is among those few specially positioned communities within this state that have grand opportunities for the future but if whose opportunities are passed by, may well miss the chance to capture this moment in time to build on those assets and create a much brighter tomorrow. So we say without reservation that we recommend that you convene a review committee to assess a proposed project plan to bring back to you a recommendation on its desirability on its potential impacts on affected taxing jurisdictions in the area and on the quality of community life, including community businesses. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Councilors, thank you. Any questions? I'm sure there are many. Uh, yeah, I, I just <laughs> wanted to clarify, uh, Ms. Special, I appreciate you coming and, and speaking and um, pr presenting uh, those findings to us. Um, I just want to clarify the the scope of a project like this, right? We're not talking about uh, one or two projects, right? We're not talking about creating a plan that would just allow us to develop one or two things. We're talking about a long-term, multi-project, multi, I mean, could you kind of give a That's little a more? That's a very incisive question. Uh, uh, broadly speaking, there are two types of project plans, and most often the kind of project plan that you see is a project plan that will support the development of a specific facility or would support uh, the attraction and development of a specific business. So you have one development. What we recommend for the community of Stillwater is a strategic plan which would set in place mechanisms of multiple nourishment, widespread participation, uh, under which, if carried out, and that's an important point of a strategic plan, it must be carried out, but if carried out over the next decade, could radically increase the value and attraction and quality of life in this community. So a strategic plan is greatly different from a single development plan, which may have one or two, or even three developments. This is a long-range strategy. Thank you. And there's no one single thing that it could be. It could, it's opportunity abundant. It could be. It, it is our recommendation that a, a, an effective strategic plan for the community of Stillwater should embrace nourishing the existing downtown commercial. It should nourish the commercial that is in close proximity to the university. 
but it also needs to attract new residential reinvestment in the core of the community. You know, we, we are at a unique point in time in terms of, uh, of our residential market in that there is a significant percentage of the market, interestingly enough, made up of both millennials and uh, we more mature citizens who are interested in uh, finding a place to reside where we can live, work, and play. Young people love it. Those who are empty nesters love it, and many with kids love it. I'm not saying that that's the majority of the marketplace, but it is a has become a strong and emerging <coughs> lifestyle, and the nature of that lifestyle helps us create a market to tie into when we reinvest in the core of our communities. Other questions, counselors? Mr. Batchel, I don't know if you want to get into all of the details, but you mentioned a financial uh, um, partnership with the public schools. Well, it would be our recommendation that uh, a project plan uh, include provisions under uh, any ad valorem tax increment district uh, that was a part of that plan uh, that the uh, arrangement or relationship with the Stillwater public school system should be such that uh, not only would it can any taxing jurisdiction under an ad valorem tax increment district will continue to receive the revenues that existed in the district prior to the adoption of the plan but we think going forward that uh, it would be desirable for the Stillwater public school system to also participate proportionately in the growth revenues generated by the reinvestment so that the net financial benefit of whatever occurs there would at least equal and preferably uh, exceed the economic benefit that it would receive even if you didn't have uh, the strategic project plan in place. We have worked with that and approach in other communities and uh, we are increasingly, if I can take a broader view, we are increasingly persuaded that Strong communities are going to have to advance initiatives to provide and create financial partnerships with their local schools. Because what has been happening, especially, we look back over the last decade, but especially over the last seven years, the uh, state legislature has been steadily reducing the appropriations for our public schools on a per pupil basis, on total, but especially on a per pupil basis. The only offset to that has been the local growth in ad valorem revenue, but it has not been sufficient to offset the cuts. Um, but the net result has been that the growth in local property tax revenues have cushioned the negative impact of the state declines and in, a, in, in effect really helped make those declines possible so that the statements could be made that that aggregate decline in per pupil revenues hasn't decreased that much, they could say. But the reality is that those local revenues, which under the school aid formula are supposed to help equalize uh, the load and the financial position of school districts around the state, is not effectively serving that purpose. The real purpose it is serving is enabling the state legislature to cut the appropriations to the schools. At least that is my opinion. and. Uh, that is why we believe that among other steps to advance the quality of life, the communities that want strong futures are going to increasingly find it necessary to financially nourish their school systems. And one other clarification, if the money to the, in this agreement from, came to the schools from the um, increment, uh, the, this TIF agreement thing, um, that would not affect their state aid it would not. formula. It would not. I think we all agree that we want to help our schools however we can. Questions? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mr. Dorman, I have a question for you. On uh, forming this committee, it wouldn't be tonight that we do it. We're just voting tonight that we will form a committee? You're voting tonight on a resolution that will allow you to form the committee. And then per the resolution, you would decide, uh, you would pick your chair committee chairperson and the city representative 
next week at the, the meeting on uh, September 25th. And then you also have some language in here that asks the uh, other taxing jurisdictions to make similar decisions and be prepared for a uh, orientation meeting on October, I believe, October 5th of 2017. So. Uh, Nobody has to make a decision immediately, but they do need to in the next couple and of weeks. And even if we form a committee, it doesn't mean we're making a decision. The committee is going to recommend if this is worth going forward. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Counselors, any more questions? Or is there a motion? I'd just like to make a comment if I sure. can. I mean, I, I think, um, as Mr. Bachelor very uh, eloquently stated, we as a community um, are not uh, really in a position to sort of wait and see what happens, right? I mean, we've seen um, just with our state and, and the funding available and the, the um, revenues that are available to us as a city, uh, if we sit and do nothing, uh, we're just watching things decline. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know if this is the best, uh, you know, the project plan is, is going to be the, the absolute best thing, but we absolutely have to consider all of our options. Um, and we absolutely have to, to look into every possible um, collaboration, every possible legal tool that's available to us, uh, every possible funding source uh, so that we can uh, look into the re revitalization, revitalization of Stillwater and, and continue to help Stillwater grow. It's not just, you know, fixing a couple little problem areas. It's about the life of our community over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And so um, I don't think there's a lot of dissension up here on that point, but I always wanted to make clear that I, I think uh, we would be absolutely remiss if we did not take the opportunity to look at all of these options. And I, I think that the timing, I think the timing issue is, is, is spot on. We're at a point in this community where we have pockets of things that are, that are um, growing and um, being developed and having the thought process of doing it. And so what I like about this idea is being able to maybe put those all together so that we aren't doing it piecemeal by piecemeal, but we actually have a comprehensive plan that includes the total growth area of, of the community. And I agree, the timing, the timing is now. <coughs> And I think if there's one place that this will really work, it is in our downtown core area. It's perfect for what we're talking about. So um, is there a motion? Yes. <laughs> motion to accept the resolution. It would be adopt resolution adopt number. Resolution. Uh, I didn't read the resolution. Yes, we ought to call it. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. Um, do you want me to read it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Resolution CC-2017-15, a resolution declaring the intent to consider approval of a project plan and creation of a tax, tax increment district under the Local Development Act, directing preparation of a project plan, appointing a review committee, directing, directing the review committee to make findings as to eligibility eligibility and financial impact, if any, on taxing jurisdictions and business activities within the district, and directing the review committee to make a recommendation with respect to the proposed project plan. Now is there a motion? Motion to adopt resolution number CC-2017-15. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve CC 2017-15, please vote. And with a vote of five to zero, CC-2017-15 is approved. That brings us to ordinances. On first reading, Mr. Dorman. Ordinance number 3384, an ordinance amending the Stillwater City Code by amending chapter 29, motor vehicles and traffic, article four, stopping, standing, or parking, section 29-136, prohibited in certain places in section 29144 violations and by amending division three hazardous parking section 29-148 violations and by amending article five overtime parking section 29-168 violations. Discussion? Just as a matter of background, there's no long, I have a really long winded explanation for this, but I will just tell you that Basically, what we're doing here is following a recommendation by the United States Department of Justice to eliminate the discounting of parking fines. They have made a finding in res as a part of their study of the uh, things that happened in Ferguson, Missouri, that these types of, of uh, finding structures are discriminatory on their face. And so 
what we're basically doing is eliminating the discounting portion. The maximum fine for all of these parking violations remains the same as it was in, as it is in the ordinance right now. So uh, basically, that's probably as short an explanation as I can give you. And we appreciate that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Motion to advance the second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to advance. Ordinance number 3384, please vote. With a vote of five to zero. Mo Ordinance number 3384 advances to second reading. On first reading, item B, ordinance number 3385, Mr. Dorman. An ordinance rezoning attractive land located at 1121 Southwestern Road from RSS small lot single family residential district to O office district. This is the other zoning item that you advanced uh, to ordinance stage. And so this would be first reading on that item. All right, counselors, do we have a motion? Motion to advance ordinance 3385 to second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to advance ordinance number 3385 to second reading, please vote. And with a vote of five to zero, ordinance number 3385 advances to second reading. On second reading, Mr. Dorman, Mr. Dorman, item A. Ordinance number 3375, an ordinance amending the Stillwater City Code by amending Chapter 41, Utilities, Article 4, Water Service, Division 1, Generally, Section 41-112, Application for Service. Discussion? Motion to adopt. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt Ordinance 3375. Please vote. And with a vote of five to zero, 337 ordinance number 3375 is adopted. On second read, um, reading item B, Mr. Dorman. Ordinance number 3382, an ordinance amending the Stillwater City Code by amending chapter two, administration, article three, authority boards, committees, commissions, trusts, by repealing in its entirety division five, Stillwater Community Center Board, sections 2-238 through 2-266. Division six, Accessibility Advisory Board, sections 2-267 through 2-298. Division seven, Community Relations Committee, sections 2-229 through 2-322. And Division 10, Business and Improvement District number one board, sections 2-378 through 2-411. And by repealing in its entirety, chapter 33, Parks, Events, and Recreation, Article 2, Parks, Events, and Recreation Board, Section 33-32 through 33-58. And by amending Chapter 23, Land Development Code, Article 2, Administration, Division 2, Boards, Commissions, and Groups, by amending Section 23-25, Membership, and Section 23-27, Quorum and Voting, regarding the Planning Commission, and by amending Chapter 2, Administration, Article 3, Authority Boards and Committees, Commissions, Trusts, Division 2, Audit Committee, by amending Section 2-148 through 2-168 regarding the Audit Committee. Discussion. <laughs> Can you read that again? <laughs> <laughs> motion to adopt. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt Ordinance Number 3382. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero, ordinance number 3382 is adopted. That brings us to ordinance number 3383, Mr. Dorman. An ordinance amending, or excuse me, an ordinance rezoning a tract of land at 1215 Southwestern Road from RSS Small Lot Single Family Residential District to O Office District. Discussion. Motion to adopt ordinance 3383. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt ordinance number 3383, please vote. With a vote of five to zero, ordinance number 3383 is adopted. That brings us to reports from officers and board. City attorney. Nothing to report tonight, ma'am. City manager. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> At our airport, we have to go through TSA screening, so uh, the Transportation Security Administration will continue to accept driver's licenses and state-issued ID cards from all jurisdictions until at least January 22nd, 2018. Meanwhile, the Oklahoma Department of Public Safety plans to request extensions until its new Real ID compliant driver's license system is in place. If these extensions are granted, it will allow Oklahomans to continue to use their Oklahoma driver's license and ID cards to gain access to federal facilities, that means like the courthouse in Oklahoma City, and board commercial aircraft. However, 
Starting January 22nd, 2018, passengers with a driver's license issued by a state that is still not compliant with the Real ID Act and has not been granted an extension will need to show an alternative form of acceptable identification to board domestic flights. More information is available at dhs.gov forward slash real dash ID. This has been an ongoing discussion in our legislature for a number of years and um, they knew the day of reckoning was coming. Uh, they did pass a Real ID Act last year under the gun from the federal government. Um, I don't know that they have the financial resources to implement the system just yet. Um, I can tell you from experience because the last time they were going to do this, uh, I applied for a passport, did not have one. It takes about 90 days to get it unless you pay a lot of money to uh, expedite the issuance of a passport. That is the other form of ID that will be accepted at both courthouses and uh, airports and other federal institutions or installations. If you want to get on a military base, if there are all kinds of things that uh, you may need other ID for. So you may want to keep your ear to the ground on that subject. And that is about 120 days away. Uh, January 22nd. January 22nd. Today mm -hmm. is September 18th. So. You have about four months, and it takes, if you're going to get a passport, 90 and days. So Oklahoma's been asking for extension for the last eight to ten years. I just I don't know how that will come in. So anyway. More evidence up. that waiting on our state government to help us out is probably not a good idea. <laughs> There's a special <laughs> session. I have a lot of hope for that special session. Okay. City Council, anyone have any news? This is Councilors and Audie. This is, oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, if you guys have noticed, downtown, if you're looking for a nice place to enjoy a cup of coffee or read a book, we now have another great option uh, by the Chris Salmon Plaza located on <coughs> Avenue and Main Street. This past April, the Business Improvement District Number 1 allocated funds to purchase 10 benches and four table bench sets. Um, it's wonderful. We have a wonderful place, wonderful places now to sit downtown and, and do those sorts of things. The weather's finally getting nice to wear. Um, it's good to do that. Several were placed at the Chris Salmon Plaza, but the remaining benches will be installed at various locations downtown. So keep your eyes open and more benches will soon to come. And visit the new shop. Vice Mayor. Yes, um, this year is Stillwater Halloween Festival, always a huge raucous success, it is Tuesday, October 24th, downtown Stillwater between 7th and 10th. The festival will run from 5 to 8 p.m. and will include trick-or-treat with area businesses, restaurants and organizations, local food trucks, great music, entertainment. Inflatables and carnival games will be free of charge hosted by the Oklahoma State University Recreation Management and Recreational Therapy students. So get Such your costume ready. Time. Get yes. your costume ready. Such a fun time. And Councilor Wedlick, I don't know if you know this, but usually the newest council member becomes a judge. Yes. All right. Yeah. So yep. sign me up. Just You're ready. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> okay. <doesn't> <laughs> Councilor Joyce. Uh, I have the sad news tonight. Uh, both the Boomer Lake Park and Southernwood splash pads will close for the season on October 2nd. Uh, until then, the splash pads uh, remain open until remain open from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily, uh, but hours could vary depending on the weather. Right now, that's still nice to go it's nice and out warm there, there yeah. when it's 90 degrees. It's a lot warmer outside than it is in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that end here. of the podium thinks that that too. <laughs> Uh, okay. And finally, for all you fall cleaners out there, the City of Stillwater is holding its Fall Household Hazardous Waste Collection event. Uh, that'll be Saturday, October 21st uh, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And that, that'll be at the uh, City of Stillwater Convenience Collection Center uh, located at 807 South Perkins Road. Uh, residents are encouraged to drop off not only household pollutants, and this is free of charge, free of charge, <laughs> Um, but as well as unwanted pharmaceuticals. Um, let me get off on an aside here for a second, but it is, it is exceedingly important not to throw away unwanted medications in the trash or in the toilet. So this is an excellent opportunity, unless you want to drop them off at my office, to get rid of the, uh, the medications that you don't need anymore in a legal uh, and safe manner. Um, so again, that's October 21st from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And for additional information on what uh, is accepted, you can go to stillwater.org. 
And it's also a safe thing, so you don't have it out for kids. So Absolutely. Uh, we really encourage, and it's free. It's and free. all those that paint cans oh, in jar. your garage, and all of those other things that you need to get rid of. So it's a great service. So, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn the city council meeting. Please vote. And with a vote of five to zero, the city council meeting is adjourned. We go now to Stillwater Utilities Authority. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Trustees, does anyone wish to remove an item on the consent docket, or is there a motion for the consent docket? Motion to approve consent docket. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. Please vote. And with a vote of five to zero, the consent docket is approved. That brings us to reports from officers and boards. General counsel. Nothing to report, ma'am. General manager. Nothing to report, ma'am. Trustees. No, ma Nothing. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. Stillwater Utilities Authority, please vote. With a vote of five to zero. Stillwater Utilities Authority is adjourned. That brings us to Stillwater Economic Development Authority. I call that meeting to order. Consent docket, trustees, does anyone wish to remove an item or is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve the consent docket. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the Stillwater Economic Development Authority. Consent docket, please vote. The vote of five to zero, the consent docket is approved. That takes us to five general orders. Item A, Mr. McNichol. Uh, that report will be given by our CFO, Melissa Reams. Good evening, trustees. I just wanted to take this time to update you on the conclusion of our business improvement district number one. Uh, the district expired on August the 20th, and based on cash projections, they are going to leave a balance in that fund after they have satisfied all of their encumbrances of approximately $79,000. The recommendation coming to you this evening from that board is that that money be designated, set aside for the purpose of <clears throat> maintaining the, the landscaping and the improvements to downtown that have been performed over the last 10 years. So that is the recommendation we are bringing forward this evening. Based on those mm -hmm. funds, how long will that last? Um, the current landscaping agreement uh, that we have in place this year is 16-5. So I'm estimating between four and five years, just depending on what needs to be done downtown. Okay. Other questions, trustees? Is there a motion? Do we take a vote on this? Yes. You can, no. yes. Okay. Is there a motion to accept staff's recommendation? Staff's recommendation and your bid board recommendation. Okay. So moved. Yes. <laughs> yes. We have a motion and a second to accept staff and bid board recommendation <coughs> to keep that money in place. Designated. Yes, ma'am. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero. Thank that you is so approved. Much. Thank you, Melissa. Reports from officers and boards, general counsel. Nothing to report, ma'am. General manager. No items, ma'am. Trustees. No items. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. We have motion and a second to adjourn. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero, the Stillwater Economic Development Authority is adjourned. And that brings us to our last agenda tonight. And that is a special meeting agenda. For the Block 34 Citizens Task Force, we welcome everybody who's in the audience or they can come in if they're waiting outside. <laughs> and to, okay, and if the task force members could come up to the front row, because I would like to introduce you. I bet I said we'd be here. It says 6.30. Yeah, the agenda says 6.30. Yeah. 
are, who are we missing? Uh, There's Ross. Yeah, Rest. okay. So. Ariel. Ariel Ross. Mm -hmm. okay. You want to just take a recess? Yes, we'll just take a recess for a minute and we'll come back as soon as the last member arrives. We'll start again. So we are now in recess. 